There's something endlessly fascinating about imposters, specifically someone who takes on a false identity. Although in practical reality these people are just criminals, con artists and swindlers, when captured on screen there is something about these stories that lures us in. Sure, the swindle might be fun, but it has far more to do with the concept of the self, how trapped we can feel within our own skin, and our intimate relationship with our sense of identity. How we know deep down that we have many shades to our personality, that some people just manage to unlock a specific part of us, some people limit our characteristics, almost as if by default they make us feel more silent, more disengaged or passive. And some people have a false perception of us, based on our limited interactions with them. So much so, that they effectively know a stranger who looks like us. But who are we really? Our thoughts when we're alone? The person we present to others? Or the person others believe us to be? Let's examine the theme of identity in three movies about imposters. Catch Me If You Can, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and the imposter to try to understand why these stories appeal to our sensibilities. It was comedian Simon Amstel that first pointed out that when we're traveling alone, we are most confronted with our true selves. And what I like about being alone in another country, anonymous, is you find out who you are. And if you are alone, who are you? This is because our sense of identity is casually reinforced by those around you. Their expectation of you, based on your history of behaviour, creates a feedback loop. This is why the characters in these stories are usually lone wolves, with no one to remind them of who they're meant to be. The first element is the most obvious. Fantasy. Watching someone behave with total disregard to consequences is very freeing. We get to live vicariously with the characters, as they somehow manage to trick the system that we're all perpetually stressed and trapped in. Between education, work, bills, family, relationships, life can be hard, and sometimes we fantasize about reaping all the rewards for work we didn't actually do, to somehow be an exception to the harsh necessities of existence. Typically these characters come from nothing, and find a way to suck free money out of the world around them. Con artistry exposes that our society is really based on the currency of trust, and that currency can be freely exploited. Almost like they're proving a cynical theory that the world really is just people walking into rooms and saying things, and watching someone do this successfully makes us think that perhaps if we did the same thing, there would be no limit to our potential. This aspect moulds with the self-help narrative that perpetuates throughout the media. The Nike platitudes, the power of positive thinking. Anything is possible, but only if that is what you believe. But as human beings, we may have bursts of those inspiring feelings, but we're also bogged down with anxiety and self-doubt, which oddly makes us feel safer and more grounded in this darker, nihilistic way of thinking. You are not special. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything else. Most people are so plagued with meandering uncertainties that they feel anxious when they do anything wrong, or even when they don't, but just suspect they have. Like imposter syndrome, which is defined by Miriam Webster as a false and sometimes crippling belief that one's successes are the product of luck or fraud rather than skill. Whereas these characters possess no such affliction, appearing to personify the exact opposite. Instead of doing something real and feeling inadequate, they do something fraudulent and feel great as long as it pays off. A short-sighted but truly outcome-orientated philosophy. The magic is usually that the imposters not only take on a role they don't deserve or aren't qualified for, but they place themselves in charge of other qualified people, even making them feel inadequate. Do you concur? Uh, concur with what, sir? Blue it, didn't I? Why did I concur? But as thrilling as these characters are to watch, we actually relate to their desire to shed their identity, as they're usually running away from their past, or symbolically running away from themselves. In Catch Me If You Can, Frank is petrified by his parents' divorce and flees. In The Talented Mr. Ripley, Tom is a working class man, more of a servant of the rich, ashamed of his position in the world, stating, I always thought it would be better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. And in The Imposter, Frederick Bourdain reveals he's running away from his childhood where he was unwanted and never had a sense of belonging. As long as I remember, I wanted to be someone else. Someone who was acceptable. 
So the only, only thing left there was, was one, go to prison, two, prove to them that I'm someone. And that's how it feels, like a prison, as if you're trapped in your own body, in your own circumstance, in your own identity. The desire to just break free, to shed your skin, walking out of one door, and once you walk through another, to just assume a new identity, a new history, a new name, a new role. I was reborn. <laughs> I was born again. In Greek mythology, there was Yanis, the god with multiple faces, who oversees beginnings and changes, doorways and gates. The faces are perceived to be looking back at the past, as well as forward to the future. Throughout the talented Mr. Ripley, there is a heavy concentration on the theme of identity. Voice, clothes, glasses, signatures, names, and of course, the face. Our face is in some ways our mask, our perceived character, as this is what others see and what we see reflected back to us wherever we go. We see this when Dickie's passport is questioned, as it's an old photograph. And when Tom kills Dickie, he smashes his face in with an oar, as if the identity of Dickie Greenleaf is now faceless. When Freddy discovers the truth, Tom bludgeons him on the head with the face of a statue. Before being exposed, he asks Peter to tell him some nice things about Tom Ripley, and as he does so, he strangles him, as if these are the last nice words about Tom Ripley that will ever be spoken, as that identity is now dead too. There's also a theme of different sides of the face blocking parts of our identity, as Tom either has his face covered by a doorway, or we see the light side of his face transform to the dark side of his face. And we also see Tom look at himself in the mirror, or spot broken mirrors reflecting back at him. Even the opening credits reveal Tom Ripley's face in shards, like a broken mirror being put back together. What's interesting and more sinister about Ripley and the imposter is that they do not create new identities to hide in, but find a host and steal their identity. Tom Ripley develops an obsession and lust for Dickie Greenleaf, envious of everything about him. His looks, his interests, his wealth, he feels he could do a better job of appreciating what he has, as Dickie takes it all for granted. In The Imposter, Frederick assumes the identity of Nicholas Barclay, a missing child from the United States, feeling justified because he never had a home and Nicholas appears to have a loving family. Although Tom Ripley could mastermind a plan and pull off wearing Dickie's clothes and haircut, Frederick was an intriguing case because he looked nothing like Nicholas. He was a grown man with a shaved beard and foreign accent, pretending to be a teenager. However, despite all of this, he was still accepted as Nicholas by the family, which solidified the identity. He then wanted to push it further and further by gaining notoriety in the media so his face would forever be tied to that name, as perception is reality. I wanted the media's attention so that I would make Nicholas even more real, that people would really believe that I'm Nicholas. What's interesting is that for all three characters, their identity is not based on their actual belief that they are this person, but based exclusively on other people's validation of that role. And we all do this each and every day, validating those around us by the role they purport to play. Catch Me If You Can puts a heavy focus on uniforms and how much faith we put in them. When Frank is perceived to look like the substitute teacher, he acts like he is the substitute teacher. Quiet down, people! My name is Mr. Abignail! And then the class respond accordingly. When he puts on a pilot's uniform, he's automatically treated like a celebrity. Even the same bank teller who rejected him days earlier is so mesmerized that he wants to shake his hand. The same reason the Yankees always win. Nobody can keep their eyes off the pinstripes. But as freeing as it is to transform yourself into someone else, almost at the click of a finger, it also has a dark, sinister side. Beyond the fact that this is obviously criminal behavior, these stories highlight real questions about the self. If you are playing a role, constantly lying to others about who you are, and they're echoing those lies back to you, who even are you anymore? We see this in Catch Me If You Can, when Frank's lies catch up with him, and he has to try to justify his behavior to the woman he loves. A name, right? A name, it doesn't matter. My name is Frank Connors, right? That's who I am with you. But, but we, we all have secrets. But a name does matter. It's your consistent identity throughout your life. By changing your identity constantly, your existence is transient because there's no continuity. 
and our true character is derived from our experiences, the highs, the lows, achievements and shortcomings. Everything Frank is saying is so earth-shattering to Brenda, because she's catching up with the web of lies she's been living in, which is why she demands to know his real name, because she needs to know who she's really been talking to. As without a real name, it's as if she's been talking to a stranger, as it's all fake. Frank, William Abagnale, Jr. Notice how he details every part of his name, each word revealing so much about his actual identity. His roots, his mother's last name, his father's first name, both of whom were the reason he ran away from home in the first place. In the case of Tom Ripley, his identity crisis manifests itself in the most psychotic form, as he ends up having to kill another person and another to prevent the truth from surfacing, reflecting how dishonesty, whether it be with ourselves or others, only leads to more dishonesty to cover up the initial deception. You can never fully escape the consequences of your decisions. And that same sentiment was echoed in Catch Me If You Can. Then ask me to stop. We can't stop. And in The Imposter, as sympathetic a story as Frederick Bourdain tried to paint to justify his actions, in the end, it is what we do in this world that really matters, not just what we say. In Maria Konnikova's book, The Confidence Game, she illustrates the psychological reasons why we fall for con artists. Confirmation bias, positivity bias, cognitive dissonance, momentum theory, motivated cognition, and anticipated regret. These factors are always a part of our daily life anyway, which is why the key currency that con artists exploit is trust. The trust we have that others around us are telling the truth. Unlike the other cinematic productions, The Imposter's documentary style is more raw, especially when it reveals Frederick Bourdain's true psychosis in prison, where he continued to call other families with missing children and claim their child was still alive, seeking attention in any way possible. I didn't give a damn what other people were thinking and what they were feeling. I care about myself, just about myself. Each of these stories pose interesting questions to the audience about the self, and identity. What does what I'm wearing communicate about me? Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and question, who am I looking at? Does my face match my personality? And if it does, is that because my face matches my personality or because my personality has adapted to my face? Who do I want to become and who do I no longer want to be? And do the little lies we sometimes tell ourselves and others enable us the space to truly change or construct an artificial reality around us so we can simply hide from the truth.